Hey guys, hoping all is well with everyone. So in this video, we're going to be continuing our read-along of the Secret Zoo Raids and Rescues. And the last time we finished off, we finished uh, kind of through the prologue through Chapter 2. So we'll be starting with Chapter 3 today, and uh, we'll jump right into it here. Chapter 3, Chickadee Lane and the Kitty Train. When their class was dismissed on Wednesday afternoon, the scouts snatched their jackets from their lockers and headed outdoors. They hurried across the school grounds, crossed Jenkins Street, then ran through the west gates of the Clarksville Zoo. Within minutes, they reached Chickadee Lane. Two small buildings were joined by a winding breezeway with open walls. Chickadees flew freely in and out, pecking at feeders and raining seeds down their white feathered breasts. There he is, Richie said. He pointed to where Mr. Darby stood, feeding a chickadee that had perched in his open palm. His long gray hair was pulled back in a ponytail, and his bushy beard lay across his chest. The scouts followed a pathway of colorful brick pavers that wound through a crowded garden. Feeders and nesting boxes dangled from the limbs of bushes and the eaves of a gabled rooftop. Mr. Darby turned to the scouts and smiled. Even on the gray, overcast day, he wore his sunglasses, but he traded his customary velvet jacket for a simpler jacket. He looked oddly ordinary this way, like someone's grandfather rather than the leader of a secret kingdom filled with animals and magic. Probably not a good idea for me to get caught with a chickadee in my hand, the old man said. He lightly tossed the bird into the air, where it darted out of sight. But one can hardly resist the temptation. To hold the animals? Megan asked. No, he answered. To be so loved... The scout stayed quiet until Ella broke the silence. Okay! What's the status, Mr. D? Mr. Darby peered in all directions to make certain no one was around. Then he leaned toward the scouts and in a hushed voice said, We're doing what we promised ourselves we'd never do. Jeopardize the secrecy of the secret zoo to rescue some of our own. He paused and adjusted his sunglasses. Blizzard and Little Bighorn. We're going after them. We know, Noah said. Mr. Darby pulled back his shoulders and stood very straight. You know? Ella said, We happened to watch an animal activist in town for a visit. He looked like a secret citizen we once met. Mr. Darby considered this. I sometimes forget how curious and perceptive the four of you are. A chickadee jumped out of the bushes and landed on the old man's shoulder. Mr. Darby politely brushed it off, then turned and headed down the breezeway, saying, Let's find a spot protected from curious eyes, yes? The scouts followed him down the brick path and stepped into one of the small buildings. Mr. Darby waited to speak until the floor, a door fell closed behind him. If Blizzard and Little Bighorn disappear from the Waterford Zoo, there certainly needs to be a good reason. Our constructor, our fake protester, will provide that reason. We hope people will believe that a fictitious, unnamed group of animal activists abducted our animals. Richie said, And you think people will actually buy that? They will when they see the signs. What signs? The flyers that our crosser has been distributing will be scattered throughout the Waterford Zoo. Megan asked, but don't you think people will freak out when no one can find two missing zoo animals? As the old man shrugged, a chickadee perched on his shoulder. He softly stroked the bird's head with one finger and said, Hello, Jubs. It still amazed Noah to think that Mr. Darby knew all the animals' names. Mr. Darby said, I've decided that's not my concern. I once believed I could offer up Blizzard and Little Bighorn as sacrifices to protect our world. But I've since learned that I can't. My only ambition now is to rescue my beloved gifteds and bring them home. What about Tank and the Descenders? Noah asked. How do we rescue them? The Secret Council is convening right now to take a look at the, some information we've gathered, and we'd like you to join us. Noah's been closer to DeGraff than anyone in our recent history. He might have a valuable insight. Plus, we have something else to discuss with you. To propose to you, actually. 
Oh boy, Richie said. A second chickadee touched down on Mr. Darby's shoulder. The old man raised his hand and allowed it to jump to his index finger. Why, hello there. His sentence stopped short. He drew the bird away from his eyes and then pulled it back a few inches again, as if trying to bring it into focus. Why, what's your name, little one? I can't seem to... He moved the bird forward and back again. Looks like it's time to give up fashion for function and trade in those sunglasses for some bifocals, Ella teased. Mr. Darby flicked his wrist and tossed away the chickadee, which struggled to get its wing in rhythm. Yes, well, he gently swiped the other chickadee off his shoulder and somewhat said urgently, Let's go, shall we? He brushed past the scouts and pulled open the door. When he stepped outside, snow swirled around his feet. He began to walk off, the scouts following. I know our time is limited, Mr. Darby went on. So I arranged for a ride back to Giraffic Jam, which has an easy portal to the secret zoo. A ride? Richie asked. Mr. Darby swept his arm toward a nearby building with open walls and an open uh, wooden floor, a railway platform to board the, secret, the Clarksville Zoo train, which stood waiting there. Care to go aboard? The old man walked to the near to the train and climbed on. The scouts piled in. Richie beside Mr. Darby, the other scouts in the seat across from them. Ella, sitting directly in front of Richie, kept banging her knees against his as the two jolted for space. Come on, Ella said. Give me some room, would you? I can't, Richie complained as he shifted his rear end to the find new places for his legs. Not without sitting on the roof. <laughs> Sounds good to me, Ella quipped. Or maybe you could go lie on the tracks. Mr. Darby smiled his patient smile, then turned and waved his hand toward the front of the train. The engineer gave a thumbs up the window, and seconds later the engine rumbled to life. The train jolted forward, and the back as its old rods and rusty cranks began to turn the wheels. Megan's glasses jumped to the tip of her nose, and the pom-pom on Richie's cap wobbled. Noah watched puffs of steam spout into the air from the engine's chimney. Mr. Darby, Noah said. Yes, the old man said as he gazed at the passing zoo. A bright yellow finch flew through an open window and landed on his arm. It tipped its head and tweeted. The world suddenly turned black as the train plunged into a tunnel. Noises blurred in a single sound, and slivers of light streamed by the, from the cracks in the concrete walls. Everyone stayed quiet. After almost a minute, the train shot back out in the, to the open and then followed a long curve into the track into rumble into Arctic Town. Noah stared out toward the polar po pool and wondered about Blizzard, how badly he was hurt, and if, it, if he was afraid. What about Charlie Red? Noah asked. I mean, I can't believe he turned on us. A heavy frown formed on Mr. Darby's suddenly stern face. A shocking betrayal, yes. How long has he been with de Graff? The old man began to stroke his long gray beard. Who can know? Do we even know how long de Graff's been in the secret zoo? Many months, I'm certain especially if we consider what he was able to do with our magic. No one knew exactly what he was referring to, DeGraff's portal to Clarksville Elementary. It no doubt took DeGraff some time to figure out how to portal but on the boundaries of the Clarksville Zoo, Mr. Darby said. The secret society has never been able to accomplish this. Megan, suddenly a bit pale, leaned over her knees. Do you think de Graff's been able to find or build other tunnels? Portals to new spots? Mr. Darby shrugged. The prospect, quite frankly, is horrifying. Noah wondered about this. Where would de Graff go? How far could he go? Beyond Noah's neighborhood? Outside the country? And what could he do with his magic in these places? Horrifying, 
Mr. Darby repeated. Noah said, The curtain, the one from the school. Did Solana give it to you? Mr. Darby nodded. She did, and our magical scientists are hard at work studying it. I assure you they have not rested since the curtain has, was delivered to them. Excuse me. A second finch founded a spot on Mr. Darby's shoulder. This one was bright green. It studied the other finch and shook its feathers. Mr. Darby, Megan said, the last few times we saw Charlie Red, he looked different. Like a caricature of Charlie, Richie injected, or like a mannequin, or one of those creepy wax mummies made up to look like Charlie. And his hair was so red, it was like it was on fire. Mr. Darby grunted in a way that made Noah and the rest of the scouts nervous. What is it? Noah asked. We're concerned that DeGraff... His voice trailed off, as if he couldn't bear to say what came next. We're afraid he has poisoned Charlie as well. Ella sat up straight, and Richie's eyes grew almost as big as the lenses in his glasses. Noah said... We've talked about DeGraff changing animals, but never people. Council has always feared the possibility. Will he go after others? Noah asked. Mr. Darby frowned. One of our security guards is missing. Shortly after the incident with Charlie, he disappeared. As the train steamed out of Arctic Town, Mr. Darby lifted the finches and gently tossed them out the window, where they flew off in opposite directions marking the gray sky with spots of color. They rode past Pizzuria, the Forest of Flight, and several other exhibits. A minute later, the engineer applied the brakes and the train shuddered on the tracks. Mr. Darby stepped out onto a wooden platform, saying, Come, come, let's go, and the scouts piled out and fell in line behind him. Mr. Darby hurried the short distance to a giraffe jam. His walk was slightly uneven, and at one point, he stumbled and brushed against the leafless twigs of an overgrown bush. What the heck? said Ella. Noah glanced over and shrugged. At traffic jam, Mr. Darby pushed aside the close for construction sign and made his way into the building, bumping his head on the open door. Inside, he quickly climbed off the winding wooden deck and strode out across the exhibit, not bothering to greet the giraffes. Come, he called out, but the scouts were already on his heels. Mr. Darby, Noah said, you, um, okay? Yes, yes, fine. His voice was now as rushed as the rest of him. As he stepped up to a particular giraffe, he said, Lofty, please. The giraffe stared down at the old man and finished chewing on a wad of leaves. Then he lumbered over a thin waterfall and stuck his head through it. A second later, the ground rumbled and a platform slowly began to rise from it, dirt raining off its edges. Lofty had thrown a lever. One of my preferred gateways, Mr. Darby explained. I'm too old to be crawling through tunnels and riding water slides. Mr. Darby looked, took the scouts down a quick flight of steps that led down into the hole that platform had revealed. Then he looked at them then he took them into a corridor with four branches the grottoes gateways into the secret zoo one branch had a velvet curtain and a sign above it read the secret giraffic jam the scouts followed mr darby through the curtain and out and into a wooden deck in a sector of the secret zoo a man with a mohawk and a leather jacket with velvet patches was standing nearby a descender an older one than the scouts were used to dealing with. Mr. Darby, he said, I have... The old man hushed him with a wave of his hand. Then he stumbled over to the deck, railing, and met a giraffe's gaze. Ariel, my jacket, please. Ariel took a few steps and craned her long neck into a tree. Mr. Darby's velvet jacket was draped across a branch, and the giraffe worked her head under it. Then he, she swung her, down her neck, delivering it to Mr. Darby, who quickly pushed his arms through the sleeves after taking off his other jacket. 
Mr. Darby, the descender said. The old man, his back to the descender, held a single finger into the air. Then he leaned his hands onto the rail like someone catching his breath. Seconds passed. Beneath her breath, Ella said, Awkward. Mr. Darby finally turned around to face the descender. Yes, he said in his unfamiliar friendly tone, as if nothing unusual had just happened. Sir, I'm afraid we have a problem. And what is it? The descender opened his mouth and then closed it. His eyes shifted one way and then another. Perhaps you should come with me, sir. Chapter 4. The Message The scouts and Mr. Darby followed the descender out of the secret giraffe jam and across Dishi's Park and its wild assortment of animals, bears, koalas, orangutans. They turned onto the streets of the city of species and hurried across its brightly colored sidewalks, stepping over streams and dodging the feathered rumps of peacocks. They cut through alleys, through the library of the secret society, and through the waving, wavering shadow beneath the water tower. Over there, the descender said, and Noah looked where he was pointing, the main entrance into the secret, secret creepy critters. A large group of animals and people had gathered there. Mr. Darby hollered, Move! Move! as he stepped through the crowd, bumping aside anything in his path. As he and the scouts made it to the front, Noah saw what everyone was interested in. Boots, a hat, two jackets, and a backpack lay on the ground. They belonged to Tamron, Sam, and Hannah, the December, de descenders trapped by DeGraff. A young teenager hurried over. He had bright blue eyes and hair shaved so short that it looked like the stubble of a day-old beard. Another descender. Mr. Darby reached down to the pile of things and lifted a boot. Purple leather. Hannah's. Derek, Mr. Darby said to the younger descender. These things. When did they get here? Ten minutes ago. Fifteen, maybe. From the portal? Derek nodded. It's just opened and everything flew out. Did you see anyone? The young descender shook his head. Any demands? Mr. Darby asked. Was there a letter? No. No message. Mr. Darby dropped the boot and picked up a tight-fitting knit hat with a short brim. Tamron's. The clothing. It is the message. Huh? The old man set the back hat under the pile. De Graff wants us to know that our friends no longer have their gear. Send the crowd away. Pull some descenders from their posts and close off the city streets from a, for a five-block radius. Yes, sir. Derek turned and began to wave the crowd, which went compliantly. Noah watched Mr. Darby put his foot on the canvas backpack to feel the hard, winding coils of Tamron's tail. Then the old man looked to the velvet curtains, their bright sheen, their vertical folds, their tassels. He clenched his hands to, and took a step toward the curtain. "'What do you want?' he spoke softly, more to himself than to the man hidden somewhere inside the sector. "'Why have you come back?' But Noah himself already knew the answer. De Graff was here to conquer the secret zoo. Mr. Darby abruptly turned and headed off, almost stepping on the tail of a wandering platypus. "'Come,' he said to the scouts. We must hurry, no more than ever. And I'll stop the video there, ending chapter 4. But in our continuation of the Secret Zoo, Raids and Rescues will be continuing with chapter 5. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. As always, please take good care of yourselves and be safe. And we'll be looking forward to seeing you guys next time. We'll be continuing our read-along. And take good care of yourself, guys, and we'll see you soon. Bye.